I am concerned that we're going to see like the partner teams kind of struggle. Some of these new teams are going to kick ass, and then all of a sudden the new teams get relegated back downward, and it just completely destroys the feeder system. I get it. I totally understand what they're aiming for, but I don't love it. You have to understand that the partner system is not necessarily about the players. It's about the organizations who are going to be investing into this league. All right, what is up, my fellow friends? Welcome to another episode of Valorante. Look at the people waving. We have another new person today. Of course, welcoming back Geo to the show. Uh, first off, Geo, how's it going? This is uh, what, what, the, the second week in a row? Second week in a row. I know, right? I'm Hell so yeah. consistent. Yeah, it's good. How, <laughs> how, how are you, Ben? I'm great. Look, I have a fresh cut. You know, my wife spent, I spent $30 for my wife to cut my hair. It took three <laughs> hours to do, but you know, it's all worth it. And then someone that doesn't want to show his hair, a uh, long time, been a long time since you've been on the show mark Walker, yeah how's it going today yes it's been a bit honestly it was funny i was like watching the intro video uh while we were just kind of sitting waiting for the show to start i'm like oh my god i'm in this uh <laughs> it's, it's kind of weird because I, I don't feel like i'm the, that regular of a guest but apparently i made a huge impact in that one show uh but yeah it's <laughs> cool to be back uh i don't have a haircut for my wife so it's a little <laughs> a little long and we don't have the air conditioning on because it's like 70 degrees in my area but my office doesn't have a window so well yeah, I would be sweating if, uh, At least if I had my hair out. What stays gross. hot, Mark? What stays hot today in chat is that we actually have some hot items off the press to talk about for today's show. Uh, big news coming up, actually. And before we talk about it, of course, we have to give a shout out to Twitch once again for another week in a row. We're swearing on this show. We're doing a lot of shit. But you know what? Seems like it's still good enough. We're not crossing over any lines. We're still getting some revenue from Twitch. So thank you so much for supporting us and helping us continue to run this show here over at Valoranting on twitch.tv forward slash DNPeak. Now we've talked about hot news off the press. Let's talk about it right away. We have new details now, finally, of what's going to happen into the quote unquote tier two scene in Valorant here. So uh, as you look, we're going to have a few graphics going through to talk about this, but there is finally some sort of a path to pro. And Mark, I'd like you to start talking about this a little bit more and give me some details of what you've heard about this path to pro. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like we've got like a, a regional based system that's going to funnel upward. Kind of looks like a pyramid scheme. I don't know if anybody else has noticed <laughs> this. Uh, and we have this unnamed quote unquote international league uh, that will be mm -hmm. sitting at the top. That's where we'll basically get to see all of the regions at the top level combine for whatever that ends up being whether it's a league or a tournament a conclusion of several leagues we don't really have all of the information about what that what that's going to look like but we have all mm -hmm. of these feeder divisions these lower levels it's basically uh you know the the thing that we have in europe with vrl is like the same thing just kind of leading upward um and we'll we'll get to see some teams then qualify actually out of that lower level which is now going to be called challengers into mm -hmm. potentially this international league and the thing that's important to note when we're looking through all these graphics or whatnot, that's not fully mentioned, but you have to really try to read between the lines or try to read the, the fine prints, is to understand that there's not going to be any type of relegations to any of the mm. partner teams going into the league in 2023. So first off, not a franchise. Second of all, partner program. Thirdly, 10 teams, no relegations. So what does this mean right now for potentially the tier one scene, Geo? Uh, well, I mean, if you manage to become one of the partner teams, then it means that you're pretty much locked in. But in terms of what it means for these other teams that are going to be competing in, as you say, quote unquote, tier two, um, mm -hmm. they're actually going to have the opportunity to be promoted. So even though there's no relegation system per se for the teams that get in on the partner system, these teams that, that come up and... Uh, go through what is called Challengers Ascension, which is essentially a promotional league. They're going mm -hmm. to, the, the winner of that will get a, a two year long spot in this international league. And that will be the slot that can not be relegated per se, but you can lose it. Once your two years that you have earned this slot for is up, then you will be going back down into the regular Challenger League. And I think it was mm -hmm. from 2026, they're gonna bring in two teams per Correct. year rather than just one team because they're gradually going to increase the number of teams who are going to be playing in that tier one space so if you're in those original 10 teams at the tier one space you've been accepted into the partner system you're in you're locked that's it um mm -hmm. but if you're one of these challenges teams and you actually earn a spot there you get guaranteed two years there and then it does not matter what your performance is you could have won champions that year you will still go down into <laughs> challenges again and then have to earn that spot again because the whole point is you can't be guaranteed the spot because there has to be a distinction right yeah 
I hear you sighing, Mark. So, so what's going on? What's going on through your mind? I mean, we 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 kind of saw this in CS, right? When ESL introduced their partner teams, we saw how the program kind of got screwed up because teams really couldn't easily get relegated, and if they did get relegated, they somehow managed to build the league out bigger and invite those teams back in, even though they sucked. So, I am concerned that we're going to see like the partner teams kind of struggle. Some of these new teams are going to kick ass, and then all of a sudden, the new teams get relegated back downward. And it just completely destroys the feeder system. I get it. I totally understand what they're aiming for, but I don't love it. I feel like there's definitely a flaw there. I, mm -hmm. I kind of think what's going to end up happening, though, and, and we were talking about this beforehand, is that bad teams are going to just do bad and then get dropped, and the teams that came up are just going to get signed by the partner teams and stay with that orc, and then the, well, this, this other team's got a void. Yeah, we just don't know that yet, right? Because we don't know what the fine print entails as to, right. okay, if I am Team X and I'm I'm sucking for the next two years, but I'm part of the partner program, can I actually drop my whole roster and pick up a, a brand new roster that has been killing it in like the, the, the VRLs or Ascension Leagues right now or the Challengers for 2023? So there's still some regulations and rules that probably has to come out and, and get more details around that or the Tier 1 scene, but at least... From what it looks like from the tier two scene, it looks quite cool. I think in layman terms, how I how I how I see it right now, and I and correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but it almost feels like looking at the challengers for 2023, it's going to be VRLs plus once you get into the playoffs, which is going to be more international, you now have an opportunity to play into what would be now the champions or the masters uh, global events if you're actually winning those tournaments. So uh, in layman's terms, a great opportunity for these teams to move up for two years, which you still get the stipends uh, and uh, the benefits of the partner teams in a tier one, if you're one of those teams that are promoted for the next two years. Uh, and then, of course, an opportunity for the for the teams and the players that have done well to potentially get poached and picked up into the new teams because there's also a, a period of uh, uh, roster transitions, I think, between like October and February that was uh, that was reported by George Gadez. So uh, let me know your thoughts about that. Uh, is that, for me, as a Tier 2 player, is still something that's very enticing uh, that I want to be a part of for 2023, in my opinion. I, I have to say, I actually kind of disagree with the concerns that Bok has because mm -hmm. I think that um, let's imagine that you have a normal promotion relegation system you as the you know the team like you can still have a really ephemeral experience in the tier one you could just go straight down but i think what's nice about this is you are guaranteed at least two years in the tier one league which is a very long time to have a guarantee as a team not in a franchise system um and i think the idea is that you you have to understand that the partner system is not necessarily about the players it's about the organizations who are going to be investing into this league and so what that does mean is that if you are in one of these like challenges ascension teams you come through uh if you are good enough and your org doesn't like let's say own a spot i know that that's technically not what it is but let's say you know you're not a partner org um you are there long enough and going through enough uh off season points and um you know points of roster mania that yes you can be like picked up by another team and i think that this is a more secure way of that being possible than it would be um in a regular like promotion relegation system the one question that i have is that um because i assume that the partner teams are going to be held to like i said like in the off season is when you can start making like um you know roster swaps and whatnot but let's say you're an org who gets this spot like the the mm -hmm. two year spot um are you gonna be held to like a three out of five rule what's to stop mm -hmm. you like legally from ditching your whole roster that got you there <laughs> and then and then picking up another five and right. what happens if you get into the system and then one of the partner teams wants to pick up your entire roster they want to buy your entire roster out then what happens because i think that that should be allowed but there has to be some system of protection for the teams that qualified to get in um and i assume that that is something that riot's going to put in place judging by the fact that they have three out of five rules for other things it's the reason that fpx couldn't play in uh, masters one this year um so i'm expecting that to come out but i would love to see some clarity on that because i think that's going to be very important for players in particular mm -hmm. mark anything to to counterpoint yeah. on yeah i i think one of the things that that i concern myself with or that i'm concerned with is you know 
I'm a curmudgeon. I've been around esports long enough to watch how things kind of fall apart. Best intentions mm-hmm. don't always work out. If I'm a partner team, and even if we make it in, or a, a non-partner team, excuse me, even if we make it in, and we last the two years, we perform okay. Maybe we don't win, but we perform okay. I feel like the second that team gets relegated, team's gone. Uh, the best players will get signed to the better teams because they'll have a guarantee of playing at this top-level international league without having to worry about being relegated again in two years, regardless of their performance. So I just feel like you'd lose like some of those cool storylines where you see teams kind of come up through the ranks. But at the same point in time, if I'm honest, half the time we didn't see that. Like when we were looking at CS, you would see a team come up from like the lower ranks and they would usually suck. Like they would mm-hmm. make it to the pro level and they just wouldn't be good enough. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you could see like there was a clear separation between the, the bottom of pro league as an example and even just like the sixth place team. So mm-hmm. I, I get it. I do understand it. I'm just a little bit worried about what this could do. I am concerned about players being poached, rosters being poached. What does this do? Are there going to be dead teams? Because that was a problem that we saw in CS. Obviously, that's not going to be um, as prominent here because of the fact that you do get stipends. There's support coming in from Riot. There's not as easy a path to get there. So ultimately, like mm-hmm. if you have an org spot, even if it's just for two years, it's pretty easy to find players who are going to want to play for you. But yeah, it's just a. Uh, I think there's a lot of questions that we don't have answers to yet, which makes mm-hmm. my opinion sort of just doom and gloom because I'm looking at it from the outside. But as we get more information we from Riot, we'll be like, okay, this makes more sense. This, this is more understandable now. At least one thing I want to make sure is, as a player and looking out for the players, make sure you all read the fine prints when it comes down mm. to signing into a potential organization, right? Because we've already learned from the skins from champions, with some orgs, you don't get any of that money, depending on what's written in there. What's the job security that you have signing to an up-and-coming and aspiring org that wants to make it into uh, the Ascension program and qualify into the partnership program? Um, what's the salary going to look like? If you're going to get bench, what's that going to look like? Uh, what's the percentage there? So. Make sure that if you have what it takes to go pro and you feel that you could make it, make sure to talk to the uh, to your agents uh, to get more details about that. Us. But you talk know, to literally yeah, anyone, not, literally anyone. Not to me. <laughs> not to me. Me well, it's so, about casting. If you want to yeah. know about playing, talk to a listen, player listen, agent. But I, I well, dealt let, with let's... I dealt with it once. It's crazy. Players sign stupid <laughs> contracts all the times. It's a headache. It's a headache. But at least one thing that's uh, well, I guess we got a camera that's a headache too. But one thing that's not a headache is actually it's the okay. confirmation. My camera overheated. One second. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, we, we're over. I, I told you we had some hot news off the press, right? Sec. So we got some overheating cameras. So let's get into the next segment. At least it's hundred thieves actually qualifying through LCQ as the North American champions, and they will be the third team representing North America at Champions alongside Optic Gaming and Xset. Now, my first question looking at you here, Mark, is this a surprising result for 100 Thieves looking at the amount of teams that were participating throughout the LCQ? Uh, I think it's surprising that it was 100 Thieves that made it through to a certain degree. I think a lot of people liked what we were seeing from 100 Thieves as they played. My Mm. surprise is that FaZe fell flat. EG kind of just disappeared again, similar to what happened with them in Stage 2 playoffs, despite the fact that coming into this, we had praised EG as being one of the more creative teams. I feel like that creativity kind of did disappear to a certain extent, uh, with mm-hmm. the exception of maybe some creative agent selection, looking specifically at um, their Phoenix play on Ascent. But 100 Thieves has all the structure in place. They have a, a, a decent roster. They have good coaching. They've got great management. So this team was built to win. I, I mm-hmm. do think it is a little bit surprising, though, that the path there was um, kind of easy. If you look at, actually, the second week of the LCQ, I was largely disappointed. Uh, you know, the first week, we had some incredibly close matches, great games, multiple overtimes, games going down to the wire. I think we only had, what, one, maybe two, two O's in the first week. The, the second week, there's only one three-map series. Everything else is a shutout. Um, I think that shows how strong maybe 100 Thieves is, but also how everyone else just kind of disappeared into the background. <laughs> uh, players like Baby Bay just non-existent in this second week that we expected to see step up. Players like Superman, who had an incredible week one, just gone, completely absent. But what makes 100 Thieves so good compared to those teams is they never really seem to lean on that individual player performance. Uh, We talked about it coming into the LCQ. Great attack side win rates, really good post-plant setups, strong executes. They were playing team-based, like, fundamental Valorant. They weren't really playing this, like, hyper-aggressive style or leaning on individuals. It just works. Uh, And obviously, you have some incredible clutch potential, too, from some of the players on the roster, which is always nice when you have that one player who can really sit back and just wait and if needed, step up huge. Yeah, that's that's Derek. Uh, if you know who we're talking about, if yeah. you're 
don't know who we're talking about. You're living under a rack pretty much because that guy was insane. And I think not only that, it's also the great calling from uh, Stellar that, uh, you know, a lot of people have been doubting this roster from the very beginning when they got picked up, when they were replacing the CSGO vets. And uh, some people think that they weren't going to make as much as an impact because they weren't a team that has that CSGO veterancy, that LAN experience. And that actually brings into question now to you, Gio, looking at this team for I think four out of the five players right now, including the coaches, it's going to be their first international land. Do you think that the jitters are going to come into play or are this, or is this a structured enough team that's going to be able to, to go far uh, going into champions? I think this is a really interesting question because it one it's one that comes up a lot. I mean, especially in Valorant, mm. which is such a young game and has a lot of young players. The guard was obviously like really hotly spoken about with this for Masters 1. And they were a good example of a team who didn't really have any land experience other than a couple of people um and you could tell when they got there um and occasionally you get players where that's not the case now the interesting thing with 100 thieves is of course that is entirely possible that it could be that way um but with 100 thieves if you consider how short an amount of time this roster has been together and the fact that they've essentially had to do a full season's worth of progress in half a season's worth of time and they've had the like structure implementation and the kind of discipline and growth that we have seen from them in that short period of time. I would say that if any team has an environment that is going to be conducive to inexperienced LAN players performing on LAN, it's probably going to be 100 Thieves. And I would like to believe that someone like Sean in acting as the head coach and him specifically having that player experience on LAN um, would be able to relate to them in a way and provide that kind of um, like extra something that they might need to like kind Mm -hmm. of have one of the people who's really in charge of Um, you know, setting them up for success, also being like, okay, I've been in this position many times, like here's here's what I've learned from my experience that I can impart onto you. Yeah, and and now that you're looking at the two finalists actually that played during the LCQ in North America, you can actually still see that it's not like, you know, superstar rosters uh, from 100 Thieves, from the guard, but it's actually organizations that put a lot of trust into finally a coaching system uh, for these two teams. So, Cupert was actually one of the latest addition to the coaching staff of the guard going up to the grand finals of the LCQ, where even when you're looking at the main season in the group stages of stage two, uh, the guard didn't look like they were at the best spot. You know, we were always critiquing in terms of their agent composition, not really following the meta, struggling a little bit of what's going on in terms of who's comfortable with what agent. But Cupert seems to have bought a, brought a little bit more uh, into this system, into this team uh, for the guard. So uh, my question now to you, Bach, is what's that? What does that look like for you? How was the improvement of the guard? Did they actually impress you? Was it a little bit of more firepower that they showed? Or did Cupert actually did make a difference in this roster? Look, I'm going to continue my streak of being a bit of a curmudgeon in the show. Um, <laughs> I actually look at, like, the first two games from the guard, and I don't feel like they were particularly strong games. They had a three-map series against Sentinels. It didn't really look like great Valorant being played from them there. Uh, keep in mind, this is the first game Sentinels plays with their new rosters. Even Shroud admitted, like, I had jitters. I was not used to playing at this level. Everyone was excited, anxious. So that should have been an easier victory for the guard than it ended up being. Then they play against Cloud9. It's a 2-0, sure. But Cloud9 is also a team that has struggled since the Zeta departure. So I really wasn't looking like that was going to be a series that was going to go the direction of Cloud9 unless for some reason they came out swinging, which they did not. Their, their most impressive victory was really over Face, that, that 2-0 in the upper final. And I, don't, I did not have them predicted to even be in that position, nor to w- take that win. So that's when I started to turn ahead to them and be like, okay, this is really starting to show how much they've improved. Because previously, I didn't feel like they were super tested. Uh, I don't know how much of that can be put on Cupert. Uh, I know that, you know, coaching staff definitely has impact on how things happen in the game. But I think a lot of what happened with the guard in general was just like their mental coming out of the loss at Masters and how they fell down into the, the, the 2-0 or an 0-2, excuse me. And then stage mm-hmm. two, it just steamrolled. They couldn't adapt to the meta. It got really difficult for them. I, I like to think that maybe it helped a little bit, but I honestly don't know unless I'm behind closed doors and I hear those conversations. Obviously, they've already got a great head coach in MCE. I'm very much aware of how uh, tactically sound and creative Matt can be as a coach. 
And I think mm-hmm. that he was a great leader for the team. So I think this, this is kind of just like his tag team duo. Like this just gives him a little bit more boost to maybe find things that he doesn't see and kind of implement them on the backside. Yeah, I think that's how it all started too. I'm assuming it was like the guard trying to boot camp for uh, Masters mm-hmm. one, and then um, they were they were trying to scrim into like the European scene because Cooper is an IGL uh, from Europe, uh, playing with Section One, I think, or Sector One. Sector uh, One as and Penta yeah, so teams, like, yeah. as a team that's trying to get into that, right? So uh, I think the conversations comes in as okay. Well, after the scrims, Cooper uh, had more conversations, and he had a couple of things to say after as well. Uh, following the event as how much he actually did enjoy his time uh, with the guard and how he actually helped Valen and, and vice versa, how they treated these ideas. So again, it comes down to the scrims that they had during the European uh, t- um, scrims that the guard had brought. And then um, I'm assuming at this point that Cupert Eyes and IGL brought a bit of that expertise over to Valen, which for me is how you saw Valen get that that uh, that confidence in terms of like his post game interviews, being like, "Hey, we're on a brand new level. My IGL has been uh, better than ever." Uh, and of course, uh, Cooper just really was humbled by the experience that he was able to get uh, with the guard because that also elevates his experience to bring back into Europe into the tier two scene. And he has nothing but good things to say about MC and about the guard. So that was a, le- a nice little wholesome story from Cupert and from the guard. Uh, and we hope for the best with Cupert uh, moving forward because it, he also stated he wants to bring this experience back as an IGL to Europe. So he's not done with uh, with IGL. He's not done with playing. Coach will be in the, the, the back end. But something to resurface in terms of topics now is that we actually do have more details going back into the Riot Partnership Program, which is actually really nice to hear. Uh, and all of this also being reported by our friend uh, George uh, over at whatever companies that he's working on all the time, Dot .esports, Deshirto, this guy's hot commodity as well. Uh, but yes, to, to get more details, the season seems to start now in uh, February all the way up to September, while in October, you have uh, like this this period of time where you could actually do transactions for rosters and teams. And then, of course, there was a little bit more details into what this entailed in terms of the stipends. Because, again, uh, since this is a partnership program, it's not about uh, franchise teams. It's not about teams buying for spots. It's actually right paying for teams. So all this $1.5 million is false, but it's all a mix of like skin sales, uh, winnings or whatnot, and what you're working as a team to make sure that the league uh, gets profit out of it overall. So, Gio, uh, reading on through this, do you think this is a right direction, stepping away from the franchise system into more of like, hey, let's work together to build this up, even if the money's lower? I think it's definitely a smart thing to try because, like, franchising got, became kind of more common in esports, let's say, about the half a decade ago, right? That's when it started mm-hmm. being, like, really introduced. And... um there's obviously been a lot of criticism since then, and and there's also the risk that, um, well, a if uh, if teams are buying spots, then they get maybe a lot more control than than Riot would like to give them, and Riot get to maintain control if they are buying the teams. Um, but also, you know, if if uh, the system fails or anything like that, you know, we've seen a lot of controversy with things that Blizzard have done. And while Riot already do run their own franchise system, I think this is quite an innovative version that allows them to experiment with certain things. But I definitely really like the idea of having like um, the skin sales and stuff like that. I, coming from Rainbow Six, where, which also has a pseudo franchise system um, uh, in that it has revenue share, but it doesn't have um, spots that you buy. The revenue share comes from skin sales which from what i've heard is actually pretty lucrative and rainbow six is Mm -hmm. not as big an esport as valorant is so i think that being able to use that as a way to generate more uh revenue for the stipends um is really good it's interesting about the value of the stipend now i didn't have like a particularly um you know thorough idea of what i assumed it would be because i don't work in business but when you compare that to what you may assume the salary of the team will be that's still Mm -hmm. not a lot of money and i do wonder like how that falls into um you know like the uh, profitability of of organizations but that's not my area of expertise so (laughs) (laughs) or is it seasonal do we know that's a good we question. We don't know the details. I, I assumed we don't it was annual. Details. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, like but, uh, some of the bigger rosters, that basically covers salary for the year. So if that, it's it's difficult to even pay the salaries for the year with that. So yeah. definitely will be interesting to see how that works out. 
Okay, and then at least uh, we know now that it's 10 teams that are moving into at least 2023 until next year. So I'm excited to see who are the 10 teams. Uh, I want to know. Uh, it's probably going to be announced sometime in Champions, which is going to be happening in the next two weeks. But speaking about Champions, again, teams going to Champions, team qualifying for Champions, back to 100 Thieves, is, you know, we're giving a lot of credit onto Derek's clutches, giving a lot of credit into Seller's uh, coaching, but, uh, sorry, the IGLing, but the thing is, we actually haven't given enough credit into Mike's HD, who currently is hanging out in the chat as well. Big shout out to Mike's HD, one of the prominent figures that helped out Sean Garris into helping 100 Thieves qualify into champions and one funny thing too is that it's not only 100 thieves and the fans that are actually giving mike's discredit it's also uh his uh opponents so mc had something to, uh, something to say about mike's hd's um what he brought into the table here for 100 thieves so ha let's have a listen to that i was just wondering how you felt about the way that sean and ddk have kind of constructed 100 thieves and what they've kind of managed to accomplish today there is a third coach on that roster for everyone in this room um, and I think he doesn't get mentioned enough in Mike's HD. Uh, I think he's very intelligent about the scene. Definitely had a lot of work with these players as well. And I think you guys would be very wise to include him in questions. Um, first off, second off, I think they did a great job. They picked up uh, hungry players that add something to prove. A lot of these guys don't really have egos. And I think it's the future of the game. They went with people that are moldable and uh, like, willing to learn and listen to coaches and i think it is a huge step in the right decision to give people chances because you never know the type of players that you're going to find or the team that you're going to be able to build if everybody can buy into a system and the system is correct so those guys have done very well but uh please do realize there is a third coach that is a huge part of that even more so than ddk yeah and MCE's experience with chaos was like one of the reasons why we know MC and how good he is as a coach. Mm. But another coach that gave him praise was also Sean Garris, where if you hear about Sean Garris, it's all about the podcast he has for Immortal Minds, his career as a caster, but most importantly, of course, his IGL career in CSGO with Misfits, the, the Cloud9 summer run of 2015, and even his experience had to actually give more praise into Mike's HD's contribution to 100 Thieves. So let's see what Sean has to say as well. I don't know if I can say this, but an epic fuck ton. All right. Like he literally taught me everything from the get go, right? Like I didn't know about streaming practice. I didn't know what practice schedule we should run. I didn't know a lot of these things. And day in and day out, still to this day, Mike has like epic impact with the team. Even when I'm watching the matches, right? Like we're constantly batting ideas off of each other. And, uh, you know, like if it's not 50, 50, it's like more towards Mike, actually, he deserves a ton of credit that he doesn't get. And in general, we're just, we're just casters and hosts here guys. So, uh, what do you think is the importance of actually having that extra layer of analytics of an assistant coach, uh, into a roster, starting with your thoughts here, Gio? I mean, I would assume that one of the most valuable parts of it is just someone to bounce ideas off of. I mean, yes, obviously you've got someone else who can um, take on a certain amount of the workload. And also there is a difference between the responsibilities of head coaches and assistant coaches um, and how a team decides to divvy those responsibilities really depends on the team. We've seen teams in the past at least in Overwatch, who did like role-based coaching, which is not necessarily turn out to be the best thing. But, um, you know, they do different jobs as it is. But I think that like Sean was saying in his answer, it's like when they're watching the games together, they'll be discussing things and bouncing these ideas off of one another. And I think with basically anything, if you have the option for collaboration, your results are probably almost always going to be better than if you're just doing it solo. How high do you think the stocks are right now for Mike's HD after we heard about his coaching experience with Envy when they made it to the grand finals of Berlin and now winning LCQ here, Mark, in North America? I mean, they're super high because coaching is, is all about respect. Uh, I had a conversation with Fallen many years ago, and he said the reason that uh, coaching sometimes doesn't work out is because the players don't respect the coach. So even MCE mentions it. The malleability of the players coming in helps them kind of work with coaches a little bit better. Like, they're a little more willing to listen. They don't have egos. I think, honestly, MCE is ultimately describing his own team as well, uh, a team of players who is uh, better than the sum of its parts. It's not just a bunch of big stars who have huge egos and they've been playing around the scene for a while. They've kind of assembled players that makes the most sense, and they're going to listen to the coaches. And now that you can hear other coaches and other players specific specifically uh, kind of giving shout-outs to Mike's, that makes it 
completely different. Uh, you know, the stocks are rising. It was already high as it was. We mentioned, obviously, his time with Optic. He was also uh, coaching for G2, if I'm not mistaken, coming into First Strike. Uh, it's kind of surprising that he even got dropped by Envy slash mm-hmm. Optic. Like, at the time, we didn't really think that that made much sense. But clearly, mm-hmm. he's found a good home in 100 Thieves. Yeah, there you got, And that's good, right? Because we always talk about teams hogging, like, talent in terms of players like DRX, but now at least in North America, we're sharing the wealth on the big brains to be able to coach teams such as MC and uh, Mike's HD, and now Chet, of course, of Optic. And that said, uh, let's move on to the next topic. But before that, let's give a shout out to you. Another one of our sponsors, of course, uh, for, I don't know, X amount of weeks in a row. It's Duke.GG, excuse me. And uh, we want to give a shout out to them because they actually started the live beta uh, uh, that they're trying to test out on their platform during the VCT circuit, where I think throughout the last weekends, even for the LCQ, we had the live chat to test things out, like-minded people to talk about the VCTs, talk about Valorant, no toxicity, and uh, it's actually a very fun experience to have. And I think they had some good success out of that one too. So I wouldn't be surprised if something comes out for champions in a couple of weeks. So make sure you download the app at juke.gg. And of course, while you're there, give us a follow on juke.gg. We're on there and uh, at Valoranting, and let us know what you think about Shroud uh, during the LCQ, and when is Shroud playing during Champions, right? <laughs> but speaking about teams that are going to play into Champions and Cloud Chasers, such as ourselves, let's talk about Edward Gaming, of course. Edward Gaming qualified from the East Asia qualifiers, beating teams like Onslayers, beating teams like Northception, beating every single one of the favorites from the Japanese and Korean scene uh, here in Valorant to now be the first Chinese team to go to Champions, a new region to be represented. And Buck, I want to know your thoughts on this team. This team is ridiculously good in their region, but that's the problem. Ridiculously Mm. good in their region. They're 34 and 5 in 2022. They're the number one Chinese team. They have a huge map pool. They're actually undefeated on split this year. Their Fracture and their Freeze look really good, often beating teams with, like, 10-digit round differentials. That's awesome. But until I see them tested on an international stage against stronger opponents, it's hard to really judge what they're capable of, which is the same thing we always say about APAC teams. When we look at teams coming in from OS, we look at teams coming in from Southeast Asia or East Asia, we don't really know what to expect on an international level because we don't see them play at that level enough. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm holding out hope that we'll see strong games and we won't see them ultimately fall flat because that's happened with some of our own North American teams at times where they go to a, <laughs> an international level and honestly, it just looks kind of disastrous. I think that Exet and the Guard are great examples of NA teams really falling flat at international competition. So I can't pass judgment too much, but I just hope that we see this work out because honestly, mm-hmm. they did look really good in their own region. And whenever we see that, we hope it works out well at an international level. Yeah, and at least then, uh, you know, the question is, how are they going to do? But PRX is actually a team that made it to the grand finals exactly. of the last Masters. And, I, uh, you know, speaking about the Chinese scene, I know we we're, it's still a big question mark, but GOU hung around uh, the Chinese scene in terms of Overwatch uh, in yeah. the past for a very long time. They just won the last Worlds in Le- League of Legends. Mm-hmm. Are these a serious contender potentially in Valorant, knowing how the scene is developing in China in all of these games? Probably not for this champions, but I think, um, you know, just, yeah, given that these Chinese teams have done pretty well in other esports, then, and Edward Gaming have also won Worlds very recently. So, um, you know, they are uh, probably an organization who's going to put in that kind of work, but I kind of agree with Bok. We need to see how it is that they're actually going to be on an international level before we can truly judge. All you really know from the Chinese region is they're probably going to do some, like, wacky shit um, and probably take (laughs) some people by surprise, which luckily in Valorant has actually proven internationally to be quite a good thing paper x being a really good example of that whereas in other games that might be um a little bit more like risky and not in a good way so Mm -hmm. i could see this being something that develops over the next few events see where they are this time next year but i'm not necessarily expecting them to come away with a champions win yeah, at least some wacky shit is definitely Kang Kang and life as this double duelist uh, lineup. They still try to run here uh, for the Chinese scene. So I'm excited to see how that's going to pan out for uh, for China. But uh, we, we want to talk about the development. We want to talk about improvements within a team too. And now it's time to talk a little bit about roster changes. I think the most important one here in North America, because we're going to have Steel later on to talk with us uh, on an interview. It's T1 making some roster changes. So most recently, uh, you know, we didn't have an, an, an official signing from Dynamic, but T1 has released Pony and Dynamic from the roster and has recently acquired Ben from the Pittsburgh Knights. Uh, so now when you're looking at this full roster uh, from T1, it's actually everybody else, meaning you have Steel, you have Swifo, 
You have uh, Autumn as the coach. You also have uh, Zeta that actually joined from Cloud9. Now Ben coming in. And what does this roster look like for you on paper now, Buck, if you're thinking about this team in North America? And of course, I can't forget Munchkin uh, that comes in from Korea as well. Unfortunately, this roster is a paper roster right now because we don't really know mm -hmm. what to expect from them. I, I feel like a lot of teams, maybe similar to T1, but not necessarily just exclusive to them, we're not seeing enough of them outside of like VCT qualifiers. Uh, some mm -hmm. teams did not take advantage of the offseason or the downtime between what would be basically VCT Stage 1 ending and VCT Stage 2 starting, and then VCT Stage 2, if they didn't qualify, we didn't see them compete in very many places, which really makes you wonder what, what the hell is going on behind the scenes because you just don't know. Now, I do hold out hope because, obviously, Steel is an incredible IGL. He's got a ton of experience. Bang comes in, or Ban comes in, excuse me, and Ban looked so good at times in the past. Obviously, we know what Zeta is capable of, and we saw just how much his departure plus Autumn's departure from Cloud9 affected that team pretty much diving off of a cliff after the one win in stage two. So I, I'm hopeful that maybe like T1 will step up, but I don't know where to see that. Like, when are we going to mm -hmm. see them play somewhere? Because obviously like <laughs> VCT is coming to a close and they're not a part of it, but they're not playing anywhere else. So what is next for T1? When will we finally see what this roster is capable of? Yeah, I think they were playing in like some Boom TV tournament locally and then potentially maybe the re edition series. Yeah. But yeah, but when you're looking at this roster now, Geo, you technically on paper, if there's no more changes, it's three North American players and two Korean players. And again, speaking to your experience in, in Overwatch League before, or even when you're looking at Overwatch League now, there's a lot of these franchise teams that are actually importing a lot of Korean players uh, and maybe having some mixes in here and there uh, of these rosters. We had that first taste with Cloud9 and Zeta. But what do you think of this roster in terms of two Koreans and, and three American players? I don't know how much I consider it in the same way that you would look at most imports, just because Munchkin, coming from the Overwatch League, has competed in North America for a really long time, and Zeta has come from Cloud9 in North America for a really long time. So I don't necessarily look at it the same as being like, oh, they've just plucked two Koreans from Korea. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I feel like it's a lot more like, okay, there it's maybe a little bit more... Um, culturally cohesive maybe is the best way of putting it but again i have to agree with bok that it really is like it's a lot of great names on paper i'm always very skeptical of super teams because you don't necessarily they are not necessarily going to come to a result that is greater than the sum of their parts um mm -hmm. and we just haven't seen it's like t1 is this weird thing in valorant where it's almost like a celebrity roster that doesn't do anything so yeah, yeah. yeah I just, uh, show me something first and then i'll <laughs> come back to you <laughs> So yeah, give note, us a few weeks, right? Slight note, they did play apparently yesterday, and I just pulled up the match just to see what they were playing. Uh, have you ever heard of Null Death or maybe Asteri 7? Maybe 10-5. I have no idea who these teams are, so even though we have a very small exa like, example of what they're capable of, it's like At least they're not barely out of it. viable results. Yeah. Did T1 win? Yes, they did. They won 1-0, 1-0, and 2-1. So. And they're there not pulling a stage 100 Thieves. Well, 100 we, we Thieves got... were like too good to... Mm -hmm. At least we got some hopium. At least we got some hopium with them playing. They win some matches, you know. So mm -hmm. that that's that's a good thing to think about if you're a T1 fan. But let's move on over and talk about patch changes. So LCQ during LCQ, we actually had a little bit of patch changes already, uh, including chamber nerfs that came out during the LCQ, but that wasn't official. So now it's a great way to revisit this, as long uh, as well as lucky at new uh, changes happening to Neon and to Jet. Most importantly now for Chamber, just a big summary, uh, if you're reading through this, uh, a TLDR, I think the main thing is to think about his rendezvous points that now have a cooldown when you break his rendezvous. And, uh, and of course, the slow fields being a yeah. little bit slower and less of a TP. For Neon, there's going to be uh, a buff into her overdrive, meaning that I think headshots now will actually increase by three. Uh, and of course, uh, finally for Jet and for um, and for Chamber is leg shots actually now exist, where if you actually do leg shots with knives or leg shots with a tool de force, then that means that you actually do not get a uh, full damage uh, as a, as a one-to-one -one damage uh, in terms of those ultimates. So initially, once we group all this together, any big thoughts? Is this going to change the, the scene for champions once we get into that competition? I mean, for Chamber, absolutely. Uh, Chamber definitely took a pretty heavy hit from the, the nerf hammer. Um, I don't think he's, like, completely busted, like, not viable anymore. But teams will have to be a little bit more selective on how they integrate him. 
I still think his ult is really strong, but the slow field is actually huge. Uh, the rendezvous is big too. The, the increase in the pistol cost for the headhunter is is not necessarily massive, but it definitely changes the way that chambers are going to play pistol rounds now because before it was just, what, buy six bullets and trademark, and you're good. Uh, now you're going to see players have to be a little bit more selective because you might only get four bullets now instead of six, and that changes the way you can use that weapon. You're going to have to go and rely on the classic, and you need that trademark, but the trademark isn't as viable anymore because the trademark doesn't have the slow field lasting as long. Nine and a half seconds was stupid. You would get <laughs> one person gets shot with a tour de force on a fast push, and the whole team is slowed down for nine and a half seconds. So you just have to sit there and wait. And then if he peeks again, up, oh, it's another nine and a half seconds. Like how many yeah. times did that just completely boom you on a push? So I think that Chamber took a pretty heavy hit. I think Neon gets a nice little buff, but it's not like a massive one because I don't think Overdrive is really even her most viable skill in her entire artillery. And I think that Jet takes a little bit of a nerf, but not too bad of one. Uh, because if you're watching high-level Valorant, most of the Jets are clicking heads anyway. So the leg shot multiplier might not be as big of a deal for them. I, I think overall it is Chamber who comes out uh, drawing the short stick here. Yeah. And does that mean that we're going to have more Chamber, less Chamber, more Cypher for that Geo for Champions? What's your thoughts? I mean, I assume that we're going to start seeing more Cypher anyway. I think the interesting yes. thing about Chamber is a lot of people took issue with the fact that he had this like full Sentinel kit as well as being able to be this entry. Now he's received buffs to like both of those uh, buffs. He's received nerfs to both of those two things. Um, but I do expect that we are going to see some more of that, especially as like with so many of the radius of like these abilities going down, he's not going to be able to have as much control over as big an area of the map anymore so being able to have better surveillance in other parts of a map i think is going to be uh, more required so that you can react to it sufficiently um but i i don't know i'm interested to see i want to see where this the balance of like are we going to see more jet come in to like replace chamber again or you know where is that that going to go um but yeah i think starting to see some of the more like traditional sentinels come back in might be something that we do see yeah, well, at least for that, we'll we'll see what happens for champions as well as we need to talk about another team that's going to be heading into champions, and that's looking at our friends over at EMEA. It's Team Liquid finally qualifying once again, winning LCQ to make it the champions, and there was some great celebratory of uh, celebrations actually on camera that happened after Liquid won, and of course, an interview with Scream. Make sure you put your headphones at higher volume to understand what he has to say here uh, on their victory. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what it feels to be honest. We we really fought like really, really hard uh, out of our souls, and yeah, I mean, I, like the practice we put in, like uh, with our new coach, uh, with our new player as well. Like honestly, like it feels good that work, hard work pay, pays off. You know, I'm super happy we we proved people like what we're capable of once again, even though we had a lot of change and stuff like this. So yeah, very, very proud of. I, I mean, all I feel right now is like being proud, and also I had, I had quite a good game, so I'm proud of myself as well. And yeah, like, uh, I don't know what to feel, like, you know, a lot of emotions right now. Yeah, you had an... It's actually still nice to see that the It Shut machine was still able to put some sick numbers into the Grand Finals. Also, igl for this team. We always critique Liquid having, like, this IGL issue moving into the LCQ. They add a coach instead. They add a new fifth player in Dimisic, and they still don't have a, a, a set IGL, and it gave that responsibility for a Scream. Is this actually the solution now to see um, the performances of Liquid and potentially see a deep run for Liquid uh, into Champions here, Geo? Um, potentially. The thing that I'm really interested in with Team Liquid is just the fact that their whole structure and way of doing things is changing. I mean, Sliggy, who is their ex-head coach, he was mm -hmm. on the broadcast and he was saying on the broadcast, like, it's it's interesting because they're doing X or Y, and this is something that the team never liked to do before, and so we didn't used to do it, and now they're trying these new things. And so I think hearing the ex-head coach be able to recognize differences that they are starting to implement that are clearly working for them gives me this idea that whatever internal structure they're starting to build under this new coach is something that they intend to push forward with. So I think that, yeah, maybe having Scream on the IGLing duty and especially having proof that it's worked, that might be something that they carry forward going into champions and build upon rather than constantly trying to change. I mean, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And it's not <laughs> long before champions. What are you going to do? Go through like all of the different uh, players like in the couple of weeks before you go to Istanbul? Mm -hmm. 
I think I think one of the things too when you're looking at liquid is also having like pocket picks in terms of agent compositions too because you know Mark you were hosting it during the LCQ and NA saying as a troll that potentially you might see more Phoenix getting picked and there you go you actually have two teams in North America picking Phoenix you have Scream picking Phoenix and Ascent but it's really only on Ascent so is this like a little bit of like a, a one time thing where you don't see it again or is there true value in Phoenix uh, going into Champions? I honestly think there's probably going to be more Phoenix picks coming into Champions, and, and partly because of these changes we were just talking about. Like, looking at Liquid, Yampi locks in Chamber for this team, and that's what allows Scream to flex onto Jet sometimes and kind of play more of a an engagement duelist-type role with a rifle than so much with an op, which is what we would have seen in the past. But mm-hmm. Phoenix is an agent that can kind of slot into that role. It's not really uh, what we've been classifying as, like, a dive agent so much. But with the way his his utility works and obviously the viability of his ult and how you can farm orbs on specific maps, I, I do think we'll see more of it. I'm surprised we don't see it so much on Fracture because of how easy it is to farm orbs on that map. I mean, you want six orbs to get his ult and you can get four of them in pistol round if you really want to. Like, it's mm-hmm. stupid how easily you can farm ult orbs on that map. So I do think we'll see teams using it a little bit more now that we've seen some of the duelists get reworked a bit. And I also love the fact that it proves EG had the right idea to a certain degree like Phoenix on Ascent does work. I just think that they didn't use it as well as Scream did here. Scream dropped almost 100 kills in, in a four-map series with him going 8-16 and 16 in the first map. That is bonkers. Uh, the fact that <laughs> if he had a good map in map one, they could have potentially broken 100 across it, averaging 25 kills a map is nuts. So you can't necessarily look at his performance and be like, oh, yeah, this applies globally. But I do think there is viability to that agent, and we'll see it more and more coming into Champions. Yeah, well, at least we have so much to talk about more uh, for the LCQ, but we got to cut it short. Why? Because we actually have a really fun interview coming up here after this break, and that's going to be with T1's IGL. Maybe we'll talk about it a little bit more after the break to confirm that, and that is going to be Josh Nissan that's going to be joining us for the interviews uh, after this break. But before the break, we definitely have to give a shout-out to Twitch to thank them one more time to support us in making sure that this show continues to allow to put us food on the table. So I, I have... Uh, I have throat lozenges thank you twitch for helping me pay for these see you guys after the break (laughs) if you're enjoying valoranting feel free to follow us on our other socials we're over at twitter at valoranting and of course every tuesday 11 a.m pt we're live on twitch.tv forward slash dnp Welcome back, my friends, here to Valorant again. I'm not going to beat around the bush because we don't have too much time with the man, the myth, the legend. We actually do have Josh Steele Nissan, the IGL of T1, joining us right now for an interview to talk about the team. So, Josh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. And you know what? I brought that question mark up before. Maybe you're IGLing. Are you IGLing again now that you left 100 Thieves and with T1 now? Um, yeah, it's uh, to be determined, to be seen. You guys will just have to tune into our matches and and all of our future interviews if you want the real answer to this question. And uh, for now, I'll just leave it very vague. Uh, okay. Well, at least give us a little bit of meat of what's been going on with T1 because yes, we we you played three matches. You're like, okay, let's watch our matches. I saw fucking none of them because three of them were not streamed yesterday. Uh, but what has the year been so far uh, with you and T1 with all the roster changes and now, of course, uh, the recent addition of of Ban joining T1? Wow. Okay. How long do I have? Because that I could be answering for like three hours. So Well, you have a you, hard you stop get, at a well, certain the, the time, short, so short. take all the time you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So at the, at the start of the year, obviously, we, were, um, we had uh, David Denny as our coach, and we were trying to, I guess... Uh, develop a younger talent yep. to, to see like, oh, these guys have potential, they have skill. Let's see, you know, can we add all this like structure and everything to it? And things just didn't work out the way that I guess the the vision was. So um, I guess more recently, as everyone's seen, we have Autumn as the head coach now, and he's come from Cloud9. We have um, Munchkin, we have Zeta, we have Van. Mm-hmm. And so now we have a different vision, different like uh, outlook in how the teams will be structured, how the team will uh, do practice, what type of roles everyone's going to be on. Everything about the team is going to be a little bit different. We have players that are a little bit more experienced and it's going to be a lot more of like people that kind of already know what to do and make their own decisions types of things. That's like the the main point of, I guess, how the roster is going to operate right now. So 
everyone's kind of got their own input. Everyone makes their own decisions and, and people like, there's no like, oh, you must do this now. You must do that now. Now we go to the next step type of thing. Okay. Uh, Gio, you're here. Your camera's still, I, I, I actually, I actually like the chat that said you're colorful as always. So I, I like that little pun, but uh you're obviously, good? obviously earlier <laughs> my camera overheated and then just now I realized that I didn't have the power plugged into the outlet. So that was great. Good stuff. All good. Well All good. No you. overheats. No overheats. <laughs> <laughs> but I am here. All right, sweet. So yeah, so let's let's go ahead and continue then with the with the conversation. So you talked about uh, David Denis here, Josh. What has the learning experience been like with David Denis in that first year before uh, you had the roster changes or at least the coaching changes within the within the T one system? Um. Oh, I don't know how much of this I can answer. I think uh, <laughs> one one of the things that we learned is. Uh, if you're a coach, don't type in all chat. <laughs> okay, anyways. Jesus uh, fucking Christ. Anyways, uh. um, it, was, it was a learning experience about kind of just like how to structure practice without overloading people's brains. I think mm. that was like the main issue that happened this, uh, the first iteration was that there was just so much stuff that we were trying to do all at the same time. And it kind of just like, piled on and people weren't able to kind of just like keep up with the weight of everything that we we're just piling up we um i say we it's it, i promise uh i'm not the big bad wolf that everyone makes me out to be i think it was <laughs> i think there were a few different avenues i think part of it was that there was a lot of input from a lot of different people and the just accumulation of all of that was just too much for people to kind of juggle and so it mm -hmm. It just we ended up losing to teams that arguably we shouldn't be losing to if we're on a you know a T1 org. Mm -hmm. Get it T1 because we're. Yeah, in... I got it. Okay. See, you're, yeah, you're yeah. good with puns. Yeah, I like them. I like them. I like them. You should be a caster. Thank you. Thank you. I, <laughs> I, you know, having seen some of the recent casts, I think. Um, never mind. <laughs> no comment. Oh, uh, is, is that is that why you're you're on Duolingo right now just to learn how to say Tour de France? Yes. I'm doing Duolingo for French. Yeah, that's my name. You didn't know that? I Josh, know it's I Alex, but yeah, is okay. it not Alexander? Yeah. No, it's Alexandre. I, I'm still French. Okay, yeah. Alexandre. Alexandre. Okay. Sorry, Mark. Alexandre. Go ahead. <laughs> so, I, I would love to speak in another language, but I know like five words in Spanish still since I'm way too old to remember that stuff in high school. <laughs> Um, for you, you, you're now slotting out of Sentinels, which you played for like a really long time. You're playing Sentinels. Now you're playing more of a controller. At least what I've seen in the last three matches, you played Sentinel one time. Again, we we're basically like blind because we haven't seen you guys play since May until last night, which we still didn't see. And we're just looking at match pages, try to, to make assumptions. But is that something we're going to see? Are you going to be slotting into more of a controller role now that Chamber has become so powerful? It's sort of like you need your op to be playing that job. Um, kind of, kind of not. I would say maybe we're trying to get me into more of a lurker role and okay. current meta, the way that, you know, Chambers just in the meta still because he's not completely blown up. Uh, that means that we're not seeing still as much Cypher or Killjoy, but the maps that we will see those agents, uh, there's a high likelihood that I'll be on it. So for example, we played a Haven last night and I played Killjoy. Mm -hmm. Um, but then we also played maps where I was Viper and Brimstone. So yeah, it's uh, more so about the lurker than the, than about the, the Sentinel versus controller. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm interested because obviously T1 haven't um, been a part of like the the main like VCT challenges for a lot of um, this season. Um, so now <laughs> that um, <laughs> now that's a very delicate way to put it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I... <laughs> You really just danced around that one. I okay. try my best. Um, yeah, okay. Well, the... Obviously, the... Oh, my God. I've literally, like, lost my words. The way... 
That's not even what I was going to say. The thing that Riot announced <laughs> literally today or yesterday or whenever it was about the um, the Challengers Ascension and the new essentially tier two um, part of the 2023 format. Um, what are your feelings on that? Um, you know, just given that kind of that part of the scene has been where you've spent some of your time recently. I think it's a very good direction. Um, I think that having seen what happened in other esports scenes <laughs> about <laughs> how there will be a sweeping change to the entire ecosystem to like how the, the pro league division like the main pro league division is run and then like teams are just finding out oh hey by the way yeah you're not going to be in the league next year sorry and it's like okay well what do i do it's like well you can always play mdl okay can i get back into pro league don't know it's like you know, it, it's good that Riot's putting out this this pathway, and I'd like to think that the Valorant Pro Players Association has had some kind of influence in that. Mm -hmm. um, there were conversations that they had with Riot, and by the way, if you're an aspiring pro or pro player and you want to know more about it, reach out to Vanity. He knows everything <laughs> about the Pro Players Association in uh, North America. So you should. Uh, the, basically the conversations were okay we we kind of like understand that you want to do this partnership thing but what happens with the tier two scene what mm -hmm. happens with the teams that don't make these partnerships mm -hmm. is there a clear path like moving up or anything mm -hmm. um so yeah basically we <laughs> it's good i think it's good that there's a clear path that uh, orgs are going to be like oh okay i know that there's a chance to be moved up and everything. That means that players are going to have opportunities to have careers in the game, and people aren't going to be sitting there with giant question marks about like, what do I do next? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I think um, I think it's a good direction. And as there is, there are pe really people that will say, oh, but it's only this or that. It's like I think this is at least a good first step, mm -hmm. considering what I've seen in the past. And I've been in, around the block for 14 years. <laughs> I can see how bad it can be, okay? Yeah. Believe me. <laughs> can can you share what's like the, that question mark as to like what's next, especially if you're part of that partner program or if you're actually part of um the challenger scene trying to move into um that that tier 1 level? Is there anything around like the relegations or in terms of rosters uh, that you'd need to have a minimum players into those teams or not or is that still oh, Those okay, so those types of details like either I'm not fully aware of or like mm -hmm. these are currently being discussed or in the future going to be discussed i like with regards to those specifics i don't know okay. what i can okay. say is like there are community like there's communication with riot and mm -hmm. you know the, the the whole ecosystem is kind of in mind it's not just like the tier one like the top 10 teams in the world are like mm -hmm. looked out for and then everyone else is like you're on your own good luck buddy <laughs> <laughs> well at least at least then continue on the topic of what's next because chat again we always portray josh to be like the the big bat wolf in in every scene that he plays but the actually <laughs> if you actually watch his streams outside of the molding and rank games he's actually a guy that has a lot of wisdom and actually tries to set up people that are like aspiring to become pro or what are the next steps? And I do remember watching your streams one time, Josh, when you're mentioning it's actually important to diversify, right? If you don't have that career anymore into pro play, what's the next step? Is it trying to build a little bit more into content creation for YouTube, now TikTok, uh, Instagram Reels, whatever. Do you think that is still going to be a very important uh, aspect as, uh, as a pro, as an aspiring pro, knowing what's about to happen within the scene at least for valorant in the franchises or sorry in a partnership program system well i would almost argue like regardless of a partnership system or anything of that sort i'd say it's in your best interest as a pro or an aspiring pro to build your brand whether that be streaming being you know active on social media you know reaching out networking getting sponsorship deals and leveraging any other talent or abilities you have so if you're good at doing like an analysis stuff and you want to make YouTube videos, go for that. If you want to do stuff where you're getting on the main broadcast, go for that. Um, so like, I guess like what you're talking about is, you know, I've, I've done work as analyst. I've been commentator. Mm -hmm. I've done observer work. I've done coaching. I've been a player. So, mm -hmm. you know, if, if T1 suddenly says, uh, steal, by the way, unlucky really, and you're out, you know, it's, <laughs> 
I have any of those avenues to choose choose from. But if there's Joe Blogs that's like you know on some other team, and the team's like, oh, by the way, you're out, and then he's like reaching out to all these other teams, and those teams aren't giving him tryouts. What is his next course of action? Mm -hmm. Oh, no stream. Nobody knows this person. Uh, nobody's going to give them a tryout because they don't. They're not known. You know, you need to make sure that you have something like a, a resume or a CV that you could say, hey, look, I can do these things. And this is why you should give me a shot at doing this thing. Hmm. So I have to ask, obviously, LCQ has been a big topic of conversation. Um, I'm not necessarily going to ask exactly about like the, the specific result of LCQ, but more in general. You know, obviously, this time last year, you were still on 100 Thieves and 100 Thieves have gone through a lot of changes in that time. Um, some have been pretty controversial. And then obviously, they decided to stick with the sort of system they're running with now, where they brought on Sean, DDK, Mikes, and they changed their roster. And now they've ended up here. What is your overall take on this journey that 100 Thieves have gone through since your departure from the roster? I think what they did this year was really good in terms of getting, you know, from the top down, um, you know, a uh, team manager, you had uh, the coaching staff with the analyst, everyone's working together to figure out what they want to do. They built a team uh, around Asuna as like, I guess, the final piece. And they found out, they found players that worked with him that everyone got along together. And, uh, or it seems from the outside at the least, that that's what happens. And when you have everyone kind of working together towards an, a common goal and everyone wants to be there and everyone enjoys the company of everyone else and everyone enjoys the game and everyone plays the game regularly, you're going to have a good time. And I think mm. um, that might not have necessarily existed around my era on the team or even um, shortly after that. And I think that there needed to kind of be that reset switch. So as much as like 100 Thieves gets memed about, oh, why they just like nuke the roster after like two matches, they didn't give Baby Bay and Eccles a chance and blah, 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 blah. It's like, I feel like that iteration of the roster was kind of just like, we need to make something happen and we're out of time. So let's just do something. And then they realized that it wasn't like, it wasn't the right fit for a multitude of reasons. And I feel like it's pretty obvious to say that, not even like a hindsight thing. Like when that happened, I was like, really? Um, and I think that the the players that they ended up getting and also the, the staff and everything around it, I think it was everything that they did in this year was a good move in the right direction. Like, a, like that's what they needed to do. They have players that all like playing the game, that play the game, that like each other and have a, a common goal. And they're working towards uh, the goal together with, with coaches and everyone's kind of, it seems like listening to each other. Mm. I could be completely wrong with that. Maybe the players <laughs> hate each other and maybe the players think that the coaches, Sean's a, an idiot or something. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's happening, but it doesn't seem like that on the outside. Uh, you know, uh, Josh, you mentioned maybe potentially getting back into commentary. If you want to revive the I by Power Masters duo from Once Upon a Time, I'm down. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll... Was that 2017? <laughs> yeah, was, that was quite some time ago. Uh, but I, I actually do want to ask you, like, we haven't really seen a whole lot from T1, and we, we start to know what next year is going to look like. We start to see how the scene's shaping up. We have leaks and rumors about who some of these partner teams are going to be. Where do you think T1 sits currently in that pecking order? Like, obviously, we have our teams at the top who are going to be partner teams. Where is T1 in that mix? Because, honestly, it's, like, hard to say. Like, you guys are ranked 26th on VLR, but it's mostly because you haven't really played VLR anything. rankings. Yeah, like, who cares about this? But, like, honestly, I, I am curious where you feel you guys are going to be kind of slotting in against some of the other up-and-coming teams, like Tier 1 and a half to Tier 2 area. Okay, so, first of all, you want me to give one of the Redditor takes of just, like, I'm talking completely out of my ass. I yes. know nothing about <laughs> anything about how the works, how it works. I know nothing about, like, interview process or application process or any conversation with Riot. Okay, I'll do one of those. <laughs> so when it comes to the VLR ranking, obviously, like, we're down in the gutters, down in the dumps. But um, when it comes to any, any sport that's franchised or partnered or anything like that, you always have the, the a consolidation of talent, right? So you have players on, like, 30 teams right now where you have 30 teams with, like, two good players per team and then, like, a couple of, like, pretty good players and a, a player that's like, yeah, are you supposed to be there? And what's going to happen is you're going to have... Which one are you? <laughs> to be determined, I guess. <laughs> I it depends on stage one. I'm the, I'm the really talented one. Stage two, it's like, hey, should you really be there? So 
I think what's going to happen is there's going to be a consolidation where you're going to have the teams that make it kind of make adjustments, maybe blurring like one roster, like if Optic made it, for example, maybe they don't change. And mm -hmm. I, I guess 100 Thieves right now with them winning LCQ, maybe they don't change. But like, you know what I mean? If if there's teams that make it, there there will be changes most likely. Um, where does T1 stand? I hope we're in a really good spot. So if they if Riot was looking at just um, VLR rankings, I guess we're doomed. And <laughs> if they're looking at other things about uh, you know infrastructure, about what they can provide to the scene, about what they have done for the scene and history and everything like that, I think there's a pretty decent chance. Mm -hmm. But I am not part of any of these conversations. I'm not even like so. If it's like the the CEO and the GMs taking all the conversations and stuff it trickles down where it, if they're like a 10 out of 10 for understanding what their chances are, I'm at like a 0.5 out of 10. <laughs> I think like every player in every team is like that. They're like, I think we have a pretty good chance, but I don't know for sure because mm -hmm. there's so many orgs out there that have like pretty good, like you could argue, Oh, this team for sure. They make it in right. No brainer. They have this, 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 whatever. They've had insane results. They have blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I mean, you could say that about so many teams. Right. Yeah. So yeah. how who? But you, at the end of the day, have to reduce like what twelve or ten teams into what six or seven or whatever it is. So teams are going to get left out, and there's no way to know who. Right. Are you worried at all that like maybe you build all this time with this roster and then players get plucked <laughs> away and the whole thing <laughs> just falls apart after all that work? Uh, I guess we'll see what happens and. Uh, it wouldn't be the worst thing that would happen to me in esports. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> so we go from 2021 unlucky, really uh, quoted from Steel, but this year for 2022 is stay tuned. Uh, it's stay Steel. tuned and uh, maybe truly unfortunate, really. <laughs> <laughs> but but at least let's have let's let's have the conversation on at least topics that you could actually talk about in terms of the organization, which is the roster in itself. So you know we got Autumn that joined as a coach. What has that been like? For Autumn versus David Denis. And I also want you to like tell all the Redditors and everybody else to shut up about Curry not being that main, uh, you know, it, Curry being the reason why C9 is not performing well for that roster because I'm pretty sure that he put up a good role for T1 as well. Oh, you know what? Now that you mention it that way, yeah, all of our issues on T1 this past year. <laughs> None of it were me. It was all <laughs> David Denis and Curry. Okay? So you'll see now that we're not playing with Curry, we're going to be insane. Okay. <laughs> you did uh, this. You no, did no, this. no, 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 no. If, if, I... if you're listening to this, if anybody you're going to be pissed with, it's not me. It's Alex and Silly Win. Who the fuck? Tour de force, tour de force. <laughs> but, but in all, all seriousness, though, how did that conversation come about? Like, why, why pick up uh, even Munchkin coming out from Korea where, you know, when you're looking at the, the, the list of uh, talent that currently exists in North America, there's a lot of free agents that are available as well. So how does that chemistry and that synergy work out with the current roster that, you, that you've built? Okay, so I'm going to yada yada a few details here. Let's yada yada it. So... Um... Cloud9 had Autumn, and T1 had David Denis, and Cloud9 had Zeta, and uh, T1 had Curry, yada yes. yada. Cloud9 now has Curry, and T1 has Zeta and Autumn. So right. Autumn is the head coach, and he kind of wants to build up the, um, the players to kind of be self-sufficient, just like um, a, a focus on, the, on like teamwork and, and utility usage, but kind of everyone's making their own plans and decisions and kind of like um, not just one person kind of microwing or kind of making all the plans for everyone. Mm -hmm. So it's been a lot of uh, just kind of like trialing and trial and error with roles, with compositions, with um, trying to figure out like what our best maps are and what our best roles are and how everything mixes well together and um, the how to like kind of tweak the IGL style a little bit and how to kind of like get everything together because we're mixing up this North American style with this Korean style. And we have players that have different philosophies on how to approach the game. For example, I have a pretty like set way of how, how to, you know, think about the game and how I view it and how I view agents and maps and everything. Mm -hmm. And now 
you know, Munchkin has a different idea and, and, you know, Zeta has a different idea and we're basically trying to get on the same page with everything. So trying to figure out that balance of IGL style, find the balance of roles and composition and, and, um, tempo and everything and simplicity in the strats and everything is, it's all just like this delicate balance that we're trying to kind of slowly dial in, um, mm -hmm dial up to 11 but we're we're slowly dialing it there to to a good place and mm -hmm. uh i mean it might not look good from yesterday's stats page but <laughs> i think uh i think our results in in scrims against lcq teams for example the past few weeks has been pretty good there's only been one team that really kind of blew us away um that being the guard actually but every other team was i mean we did pretty well so mm. I think we're in a good track. Nice. Given that um, that Champions is obviously about to happen, whereas last year it was in December, um, are you looking forward to the fact that the kind of off season where these, you know, third party tournaments are supposedly happening, that that's coming soon? Because you should presumably have more of an opportunity to play in officials against um, other, like you know, like VCT teams, um, you know, rather than just scrims. Is that something that you think? Um, that you're looking forward to or is going to be really good for T T1 compared to, you know, what the format was last year? There's zero chance that there's going to be no third party matches over the next five to six months. It's going to be just like this wasteland, this like post-apocalyptic <laughs> like wasteland where people are using like bottle caps for trading. No, I think there will be a lot of uh, okay, third fallout. party. <laughs> I think there'll be a lot of third party uh, events and I think, or I don't know how many, but I think there's going to be enough worthwhile ones that that is going to be something to look forward to playing in because i mean obviously competitors are looking forward to like the vct season making champs and everything like that but if you're a competitor like i am you look to compete like at all times and you have to take a like involuntary four to six month break it's just it's just ass it's really ass <laughs> even this year with like stage one done okay you're you're done for another couple months and then stage two it's done in like a couple weeks you're done for a couple months you're done for the rest of the year. The year like yeah. this was, this has been so ass. Just like just <laughs> scrimming and not playing matches has been so bad. <laughs> Where? Sorry, actually, as you mentioned that, I wanted to to cut over to something too. What what's that clear difference? What which is that better system? Because you've played uh, the CS:GO circuits, you've played the Source circuits, LAN after LAN, international LAN after international LAN versus now you kind of have some something more. Um, streamlined in terms of the circuit for VCTs, but it's really cutthroat into the amount of events you had less uh, less events going into the last two years in Valorant. I think somewhere in the middle would be a sweet spot. And I thought last year's circuit was pretty good, but it's also hard for me to say that without a grain of salt because we qualified for like every Masters, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. not every Masters, but every Challengers. So yeah. we played like a large um, portion of the turn uh, the year. And then we also made like Masters 3 Berlin. Masters 1 was online. And then, well, I mean, we would have won LCQ and gone to champs as well, but mm -hmm. decided to do the funny. And so, <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's a bit skewed, my, my um, vision of like how it was last year. But I'd say CS is kind of like oversaturated where there's too many events. Players burn out. The audience is just like, okay, why do I care about this, man? There, there's a tournament last week and there's a bigger tournament next week. Like, who cares about this? I think mm -hmm. what one thing CS has that Valorant doesn't have is that I think the quality of the matches and everything would be way better on LAN. I guess that's what, like, in part what the partnership thing is supposed to do is that you're going to have kind of like the, the LAN matches or studio matches or whatever. And um, I, I would imagine that makes it feel a lot better. I don't know what, like, the scheduling is going to be like. I don't know mm -hmm. any details about it, but I feel like playing online and having everything so spread apart is just not a good feeling for a competitor. And you'd need to find a sweet spot in between where Valorant is and where Counter-Strike is. Because mm -hmm. Counter-Strike, it's too many, but it's on LAN. Mm -hmm. And Valorant, it's not enough. And it's like 90% online. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. More lands is what we want. More, more lands. lands more lands. <laughs> I mean... In CS, more lands didn't necessarily help NA at all because, unfortunately, we uh, we kind of dropped the ball a lot in a lot of those competitions. Yeah.
But I am curious, do you feel like NA is going to suffer the same fate here in Valorant? How do you think NA like stacks up against the EU teams or even Southeast Asia, the Korean teams that we see popping up? Do you think that NA, like we obviously started out as being one of the better regions because we didn't play anybody else and we just got to watch a lot of it. Do you think that that's fair? Is it actually true that NA could be a strong region or are we getting weaker and weaker? Do you feel like maybe we're mm. becoming one of the worst regions? I think there's a lot of talent in NA. I think the problem with any region is about its mentality. Uh, mentality towards practice, mentality towards, you know, work ethic and professionalism, stuff like that. Sounds I don't familiar. Think, sounds very familiar, <laughs> huh? Uh, I, I think that that is the major uh, holdback of North America. It's not like the lack of talent. It's the lack of just professionalism. And I think that's why other regions kind of come together because there's more professionalism in terms of this is a job i'm going to show up on time mm. i'm gonna you know, i'm not just like clocking in when practice starts clocking out when practice is over i'm putting the time afterwards i'm doing the vod review or i'm learning my lineups or i'm you know playing my into putting my individual time into the game you're doing all those things but also you're you're not just sitting there thinking like oh i am one i'm one person and that's it. I'm playing for myself. I'm playing for stats because at the end of the day, if I want to move up and get paid more and everything, I need to show that I'm more valuable. And how do I do that? By having better stats. And mm -hmm. I think that's not necessarily the approach of other regions. It's not about like stats. It's about how can I do something for the teams that we are successful? It's a little bit more selfless. And I don't know why. I mean, I, I have ideas as to why it's a North American thing because it's the same thing in Counter-Strike. It's the same thing in like every esport, basically. It's just, that's just the culture. It's the society. It's <laughs> how everyone's just rewarded if, if you're a streamer even. It's how people uh, look at teams if they're commenting on Reddit or, or forums or of any sort. It's, that's how people look at it. They don't mm -hmm. care about like the behind the scenes things. They don't care about what hidden value someone has towards a team. They care about what can you actually substantiate through statistics. And it's like, well, this person's lowest ACS, he's bottom pregnant, whatever. This guy must be a problem and he's got to go and replace him with this other guy that on this other team, he has much more stats. It's like, dude, if you're going to have everyone that gets like three kills around, it's not possible. There's only five enemies every round. You know, how's that going to work out? Someone needs to kind of be the, you know, at the bottom and you have to kind of figure out like what type of play style you're going to have. Is your, are you going to have a, a one leaf running around killing three people around? Well, guess what? <laughs> You're not going to be able to have three kills as a controller or a sentinel every round. So yeah, what are you going to do about that? If you have or five stars, you have right? no stars. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that it's, you know, worth asking the very important and um, really very easy question of who's winning champions. <laughs> Yeah, that's very easy. Um, Chris Giggle was that fast. Is that you? <laughs> you know what? I, I, and I, Liquid in second place. EMEA forever. Wow. Duh, damn it. All right. Uh, now yeah, T1 yeah. aren't getting onto the partner pissed. program in NA. <laughs> you guys are pissed. No, I'm not pissed. I want I want the FPS back to back because I, I, I'm I'm all about those storylines. So it's nice. It will be nice to close 2022 with a team that's going to be able to finally get a back to back. And even on top of that is champions as the title as the back to back. So I'm on. I'm on board with the FPX train as well. Uh, but, but at least we could, we could actually close it off here with a final question is going back into, uh, you know, we, we, we brushed a little bit about the, the Valorant Players Association and the conversations that you had with Riot um, that maybe even helped into the decisions that Riot made into, the, um, into like what's going on with the Tier 2 scene or what could happen within the Tier 2 scene. So how did that come all about where, okay, well, you got Dazzle joining the board, you got Vanity joining the board. How did this all start? How, and uh, and how did the conversation start with Riot after? You have Dazzle coming on soon, right? Yeah. It might be better to ask him because <laughs> I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I'm not just like foisting this over Stay him, tuned. Okay? Stay tuned. I'm not, I'm not foisting this onto him. So it was already getting put together, the Valorant Pro Players Association. Mm -hmm. And Vanity and Dazzle, as, far I'm aware, as I'm aware, were already on the board. And they were thinking of, okay, who else could we get that's kind of experienced and and that will you know participate regularly and everything like that and from mm -hmm. a different team than we're currently on so they they basically said oh let's ask steel if he wants to you know come in and do it and i was asked like hey do you want to be a part of the board of and i'm like okay what does that involve oh we're just gonna have meetings we're gonna talk about stuff and 
and we're going to basically look out for all the players in our scene. And it's like, okay, sure. Like, as I'm really lazy and and everything like that, but um, if there's a way that I can help, and it's uh, you know, I I don't have to be some like actual leader in this capacity, then, then yes, if it's just like I'm I'm here contributing as opposed to like leading this along, yeah, sure, I'll I'll do it. And I think that okay, was okay. there before, so he might have a a deeper look into the history of it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And um, again, for any aspiring pros or current pros in North America, if you want to know more about this, you can ask Anthony Vanity and Malaspina, or you can ask Dazzle. <laughs> Dazzle doesn't have full full Dazzle. name; it's just Dazzle. So, Dazzle. Uh, and you well, got other big, shit to lead, right? Big Willie, exactly. You got other shit to lead too, as as IGLing for T one. So, so with that, yeah, I know yeah, you yeah. have a hard stop here, then, Josh. Um, I wanted to know first off, uh, any shout outs, any final things that you wanna you wanna say before we let you go here. Um, yeah, shout outs to Riot, shout outs to T1. Riot, T1. <laughs> Josh, um, always a all fucking the fans. pleasure. Uh, GP's always a Tough fucking Laws pleasure. started all the fans. We'll be back stronger. <laughs> and uh, do you guys have any sponsors on this that, uh, that would conflict if I were to flash something? What do you have? What are you flashing? Uh, a, per- a peripheral brand. Go ahead, you're good. Go ahead. Um, Razer, they got an amazing product line. I got a VP, a Viper V2 Pro here. I got the grips on that. We got the Death Adder V3. This I'm selling on your show. <laughs> now you have to, when you upload this, you have to say includes paid promotion. Oh, wait, wait, like, by by the way, I am sponsored by Razer, by the way. But you haven't paid us. So I have not we're paid not gonna, you. Yeah, exactly, I'll give you my so. royalties. All right, that's you, a good would idea. Would you like it? How how do you like it? Check snail mail. Look like at that. Oh, eyes at emoji. That. Hell see, yes. Look at that. Let's go. You see how we're working together? <laughs> you see how we got we're the production together, team. Let's go. We always fucking got you. So Josh, thank you so much. Always a fucking riot. No pun intended to have you on the show and to and to just banter with you. Uh, all the best. Hopefully, we'll see you in the uh, in the circuit for VCTs 2023. By the way, is that a T1 T-shirt or uh, no? Is this it just is re- this is just a uh, Death Valley. Where's all the where's all the Nike shit, man? Oh, You're... yeah, exactly. Crazy See, I'm looking, fair. I'm looking after you. I'm looking after you, Josh. There you go. So there you go. <laughs> Nike also a, a big sponsor for T1. But Josh, again, thank you for your time. Gonna We're gonna let you go. <laughs> We're gonna go for a break, and when we come back, we actually do have a second interview, and that's gonna be with Will Dazzle Lothman, the current IGO for Shopify Rebellion. Lothman, it is, and we'll see you guys after the break. Lothman, <laughs> we'll dazzle you. Okay, bye. <laughs> If you've enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe and make sure you hit the bell for the future noties, but also comment below with what you'd like to see in our future shows. You know what? Josh actually left us on a break where I was like, fuck, how come I never thought about these things when I'm casting? And that's actually having a pun out of our next guest name. And that is Will Dazzle Loafman, IGL of Shopify Rebellion, where Steel said, Loafman will dazzle you. And I'm like, I'm, I'm writing that fucking down for the next little pun that I'm putting out so I can get all the fans sussies here in the chat when I'm going to bring it out. So, Will, thank you so much for your time for joining us, man. How are you doing today? Pretty good. How are you? I'm, I'm fucking chilling, man. I'm, I'm feeling like a million dollars. Uh, but you know what? Other, other people feeling like a million dollars? Probably all those teams that are going to be part of this partnership program very soon. So I want to get right into it. Let's, let's actually talk about that a little bit more because uh, when we had Steel join us um, well, previously before the break, we talked about the Players Association. We talked about, uh, you know, the path to pro and maybe what the pro players um, had in terms of conversations into what we want to see uh, come out of Riot to support these uh, these aspiring pros or the current pros. Uh, so give me a little bit more details about this um, this player uh, association. What's different from Counter-Strike, uh, uh, from the CSPPA, or what's similar, or just details about it? Um, I think the biggest thing is honestly, well, it's not like Counter-Strike in the sense that we're franchising, um, mm-hmm. but it happened really fast. I mean, there's franchised games right now that still don't have a player's association. I'm not sure what mm-hmm. I think Overwatch. Um, and I know League of Legends had its own issues getting that started. So I think mm-hmm. the fact that it's happened so quickly and it happened before the franchising process started, um, I think that's a pretty big difference. And mm-hmm. that's really good, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so was it just Riot approaching you and approaching people like Vanity being like, okay, well, what's your thoughts and what's the, what's the vision that the pro players currently have into what's sustainable as a pro? 
what do we need to help out aspiring pros? Or was it just like a long list of laundry, uh, like a long laundry list of you and Vanity and other players uh, getting together to talk about this and present this over to Riot? Um, I think the biggest thing was actually tailored, um, taking it kind of on himself to make this like mm, tailored, happen yeah. faster. Um, yeah. And he got, you know, the group of players together that would do it. Um, and there's more than just the couple of names that I know George posted or whatever. Um, there's more players yeah. in that player association too. Um, so there's a lot of things, you know, stuff that needs to be guaranteed in the contract, things like that, um, as well as a lot of like input on mm -hmm. tier two, what needs to be in tier two, what they need to have to keep orgs like mine um, interested in Valorant <laughs> if you're not going to be a part of the partner process. So mm -hmm. um, a lot of work with that and stuff and it's been going pretty well. Were those met? For the most part, I think, I mean, honestly, I was a little like, at the beginning, I thought maybe we're not going to have any impact or, you know, is there even a point in doing this? Mm -hmm. But I think they've heard a lot, <laughs> a lot of things we've said and a lot of suggestions we have. So it's been pretty good. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, you, you mentioned the, the securities for teams like yourselves, um, being as, you know, you're not necessarily guaranteed to be one of the partner teams. When you were on LG and that whole thing just came to a grinding halt when they dropped your team, not only how did that happen, but how did you find out? Was that just kind of like, oh, hey, by the way, like, we're released of the team. Uh, you guys are no longer a part of Luminosity. Or did you have a little bit more heads up that LG was uh, potentially bowing out because of what was coming with partnerships and them not being included? Um, I would say we had a little bit of a heads up. Not mm. much um, mm. compared to when the announcement li went live. But um, I think we kind of expected it. I mean, Luminosity is a big brand. Um, and they've been in Valorant from the start. So at the beginning of the process, we were pretty confident. We are like, okay, LG can get far in this. Maybe we're not partnered, but we're going to get you know close at least. Um, so it was a little bit out of nowhere that they're like, yeah, we're not going to make partner. Your guys are dropped. We're going to try to sell you, you know, and then mm -hmm. yeah, a couple of days later, the announcement went live. So, yeah. Do you feel like, uh, Shopify is a little less concerned about what that looks like? Like you mentioned the securities, but Shopify being you know, like your new team, the new, the new org that picked you up, are they aware like, Hey, you know, next year is going to be a little bit different than this year. And how does the, the org kind of work with you guys to make sure that's going to kind of be fluid? Yeah, I can't stress it enough, and I'm not just saying it because they pay me. This org is, like, incredible. They're actually a Tier 1 org. Um, they care so much mm -hmm. about us, and they make us comfy no matter what. Um, so I can't say enough good things about them. And they want to stay in Valorant, even though they didn't make the partner. Um, and I think with the news today um, that there is some semblance of, like, a part, uh, promotion system, I think that's pretty good for them. Um, they're happy about it, so, yeah. I just want to actually go back to the topic from before that we were talking about with the Players Association. So um, you guys have like started this and it's North America based. Is there going to be anything like that that's going to start including European players? Do you plan to bring in like representation for Europe as well? Or is it, do you think they'll maybe like do their own thing and you're just going to stick to NA? I'm not completely sure i forgot if taylor said anything about him trying to start it in europe but right now it's just a north american thing um at least mm -hmm. everybody that's in our discord or whatever it's all just for north america so i haven't heard anything for that i hope they do set it up or all the regions get something like this because i think it's super important even if you're just getting like small stuff for the players done and not doing any groundbreaking like you know changing the format of anything like that um i think it's really mm -hmm. important to have that like line of communication so hopefully they adopt something similar soon awesome yeah and, and now i want to get more into like the the details of uh, of the rosters and i think i'm going to bring back some history once again because you joined this roster as an igl and i think when you first started you were doing a lot of sova plays to support uh players like your boy dre if i'm not mistaken on on raid on ascent for example i know i'm going way back in this kind yeah. of stuff but 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 to get into this it's 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 <clears throat> also to look at the evolution and how you guys have to follow with the meta because with the current roster that you have now, there's been some moments where you get into different games where, you know, Mata's maybe not performing at the best. Now he's, and then he's doing awesome. And then suddenly you also have like v Dog just popping off here with, uh, as a chamber later on. So as, as an IGL, how do you keep up with all of these metas and what conversation goes in with the rest of the team to make sure that you have the most solid roster as possible to follow up with these, uh, with these changes? Yeah, I mean, it's just like a constant puzzle you're trying to figure out, you know, keep as many people comfortable and on the right role where they can shine and then filling in the mm -hmm, gaps. Mm -hmm. Like, me personally, I'm willing to play whatever if it means that, you know, my teammate can play a role that suits him better. And, and players like Tig and even Mata are switching around agents all the time. They're playing Initiator one game, then Duelist, then Controller, and 
it's hard. I mean, I know <clears throat> a lot of the players now, like, you can't just play one agent. You can't play two agents. You have to be ready to play three, four, five different agents um, across the mm -hmm. maps. And it's difficult. It's difficult to call with. It's hard to keep track <laughs> of everything you want to do or can do when you go over stuff and you, you switch one agent and you can't do this play anymore and you got to make something new. So it's hard to keep up with, honestly. And I think everyone's kind of feeling that now, mm -hmm. even the players, mm -hmm. not just the callers. So it's difficult, but, you know, it's fun, though. And then you guys had like the biggest obstacle as well with having to face with uh, with COVID during the LCQ as well. So what's it like as well in terms of the the mental aspect and how do you fight it? Because not only in terms of, okay, the the um, the the look and feel of how the players were when they were going into the game, but like the amount of effort that you have to put into following up with the meta, as you say, it's tough. You're close to getting some victories from time to time. You're close to qualifying into playoffs from time to time. But you're just falling short. Um, so how how difficult that is that for you guys to go through these losses and how do you get through that? Yeah, with the COVID thing, it was just unfortunate because we basically all got to boot camp two weeks before our first game, and yeah. then a couple of days into it, um, Tig got COVID, and then we kind of one by one all ended up yeah. getting COVID. Um, and you know <laughs> we're on boot camp, so we need to isolate. You know we can't. If I was at home and had COVID, I could at least like drag myself onto my computer and and play and practice. But mm -hmm. there. You know, we were just in hotel rooms for the days we were symptomatic and stuff. So it was pretty difficult to deal with. And it's unfortunate to even have that like excuse in our head when we know mm -hmm. even with it, we should have won but, like both the games we played and, and gone way further. And, you know, we felt we for sure had a chance to win. We felt like favorites, honestly, like going into it, mm -hmm. we felt good in practice and everything. So it sucks to have it like looming over us that that happened. And I know my teammates don't think of it as like, oh, we lost because we had COVID. And I don't think that way either. But it just sucks that it. <laughs> is there and yeah i am kind of curious to something you know when your time in cs like I, I got the the luxury of covering a lot of it but you were always nipping at the heels uh at the pro division it felt like uh your team was always like just just right there um and it, it kind of feels like sometimes that's what's happening with with shopify as well or even when you were on lg like you were just below what it would take to qualify. Is it a little frustrating at times to just feel like you're always like just right on the edge of those conversations of being a team that's considered one of the best in NA? Yeah, I think we've kind of been, at least since we got Mod on B-Dog, I think this year we've kind of just, I don't want to say we're in the same spot, but it does feel like that. We're just in that, <laughs> sometimes we look like the third best team in the country and then some, you know, sometimes we're top 10 or whatever. Um, so it is frustrating. And I know all of us are feeling the same way, like to go out like this in the last tournament just really, really sucked. So yeah it's frustrating for sure do you find that as a relatively experienced player um you often take on some of the responsibility of helping like take some of the younger players through that experience of not letting it affect uh, how you go about things when you move forward you know because i can imagine it'd be really easy to just let your frustration completely overwhelm you and then the way you play and the way that you approach practice and whatever gets worse and it becomes a negative feedback loop do you ever take on some of that kind of personal responsibility just because of the experience you have um, yeah, I try to, and you know, I have Moose with me too, who has the same, if not more, uh, experience as I do, like competing Counter Strike. Um, mm -hmm. So we try to do what we can to help them. Um, I think a player like B Dog has had like so much growth, and I don't take, you know, uh, credit for that exactly, but I know I, I feel like him being around players like us, it's helped him a lot, and I think it shows in his gameplay. I mean, this kid is just a menace. So, um, <laughs> you know, we try to do what we can to help him out and stuff like that. I, I, I definitely Moose was one of the menaces too in, in that match against uh, Sentinels because for one of those games where you guys are, are played with COVID, especially that fracture map, both Moose and uh, Mod on the previous map on Breeze, like they were, they it looked like nobody wanted to go home in that in that matchup against Sentinels. So again, another one of those moments where it was like so close yet so far, unfortunately. And you know, um, after that, you're pretty much done for the LCQ. And then we have a little bit of like a tease of what's going on between like this off season where Riot announced potentially like a, a reignition series um, going on from, from after champions in September up to December. Do you have any more details as uh, from a player's perspective or from an org, if you had these conversations right uh, of what's about to happen? Um, I don't really have anything to leak necessarily. Um, mm -hmm. Basically in a lot of our talks uh, with Riot, this whole time they've been saying, you know, we're going to make it worth it for orgs to stay if they're not in partner. Um, mm. Be that prize pool or the 
promotion into a partner or other things. Um, so mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the, what they've made public today is their first step in trying to, trying to show that they are going to make it worth it. Um, mm -hmm. And I know there's more to come and there's more info to come, but I don't really have the exact things or anything tangible mm -hmm. to say about it. And that's not just because I can't say it. It's because I actually just kind of, <laughs> of course, of course. I don't know. And I think they're also still trying to like flesh every detail out because um, it's yeah. still pretty early. It's months away. So yeah, there'll be more to come for sure. Yeah, it, it, it's all the the management, I guess, uh, as as what Josh was talking about before. It's like you guys are focused on just playing the game. What's going on within the behind the closed doors of like the business suits is going to be left for that as well. But it's also quite interesting, though, that if it is going to um, like if Riot actually did tell all the all the organizations in some way, shape or form that you're going to make it worth it to still have teams in and organizations rather in tier two decide to pull away from that is uh, is kind of interesting to to hear that from your uh, perspective as well but mark i think you had something to say as well yeah i mean i'm just kind of curious like you looking at the information that came out today uh, regarding next year and and what the competitive circuit's going to look like i mean are you happy with what tier two is looking like are you concerned that maybe it's not going to be as viable for the teams on the outside of this partnership program um i think the only like disconcerting piece of it all was the <clears throat> auto demotion after two years thing um yeah but regardless it's good i think if the promotion wasn't there it would be a huge problem for tier mm -hmm. two and orgs wanting to stay at all but yeah. i think even with that there's going to be like some pretty cool storylines for the tier two teams and i think there's a scenario where there's you know tier two tier keep calling it tier two i don't know i hope that's not what it's <laughs> called to be honest but let's call um, it the challengers league yeah cha i exactly. think that's what they're calling it yeah right um but i think there's potential for some of those storylines to be more intense than the actual you know main season of the partner league um so hopefully that they lean into that but i like i said the only bad thing at least from my point of view is the auto demotion i'd love to see a world where the mm -hmm. partner league can expand and if teams and orgs like shopify or any other you know there's going to be massive orgs that are left out of partner just because they have to be so mm -hmm. i think letting them have a chance some way even if it's merit-based once you get in there you know to show you're worth it and you're worth it as an org that you should be able to stay but you know Maybe that'll change. Maybe it's not going to change, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, things that we discussed a little bit earlier about this um, kind of format announcement is the potential risk that if you know a team qualifies for how for one of those uh, two year spots, that the rosters are going to end up being picked apart. Um, you know, because like players may be picked mm -hmm. off of them by partner teams who do have those permanent spots. Is that something that you would worry about happening if your team were to qualify for one of those slots? Um, I think there's just like so much up in the air, even right now. It's hard to think about like that much in the future, even just because um, you know, the partner teams aren't even selected yet and there's just a lot going on. So, I mean, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of poaching and there's probably teams that are going to accept, get accepted for partner that, you know, got their roster outside of maybe one or two players, um, and pick up all new players. And maybe there's transfers from partner teams. to so one partner team before the mm -hmm. first games even start. So I think everyone knows there's a bunch in the air and it's kind of hard to focus on one thing that we're worried about happening because people are going to be getting <laughs> poached left and right. And, you know, who knows what's going to happen. It's going to be the Wild West probably for the first couple of months. Yeah. So, Yeah, I, I believe that as well. Maybe, maybe especially when it comes down to like September and getting ready for the league uh, in, in February, right? Because that's what George was mentioning before. Like the February till September is that league. Between that that time frame is where you're going to get most of the of the exchanges and, and transactions from like roster to roster. And unfortunately, maybe some also uh, getting benched too. So we'll, we'll have to yeah. see how that's going to go. Um, but at least reflecting back into... At the LCQ again, and being a player and a team that actually had that firsthand experience to play against uh, a team like Sentinels, um, you know, we always go around that meme of okay, Sentinels are doing like a marketing ploy by picking up Shroud, by picking up Zelsus, doing a lot. Well, maybe not Zelsus, but like maybe Shroud in general, and having the stream team uh, for the Sentinels. But what was that like playing against them? Are they actually a, a force to be reckoned with uh, if you give them a little bit more time? Um, I think I said this in like the pre, right? Had me do like the pre interview or whatever for the game, but mm -hmm. I thought the Shroud pickup was like maybe a marketing ploy, but the Zelsus pickup <laughs> was like insane. Uh, I think mm -hmm. that was like actually the exact player that they needed. Um, mm -hmm. so it kind of like counterbalanced itself where maybe Shroud is too inexperienced to be thrown into it. I mean, he played pretty well against us, so I can't really talk shit or anything, but <laughs> I, I thought Zelsus was like 
that balanced out any like troll part of language shroud because mm-hmm. i think zelfs was like a huge pickup for them so um it was fun we knew there was gonna be a bunch of viewers we were all excited to play the match um even though it was right after that tough c9 game it was like quadruple every yeah. time that we lost versus them um yeah so i don't think my teammates weren't even thinking about you know oh, we're playing stone knows the shroud all the viewers whatever no one was thinking about that but you know for me it was fun to, to get the it- match e- either way it almost always feels like when there's a match with Shopify Rebellion on Fracture, you know you're in for fucking something amazing as a match. <laughs> something about it. I don't know what it is. Is he gray hairs, though? Yeah. I mean, I, I do want to ask. Like, you came into the LCQ obviously super confident. You thought you guys were going to win it. No team comes into anything like that and goes, oh, we're going to get second place. It's going to be great. Now, everyone came in wanting to win. But if you were going to lose to anybody, who did you think it was going to be? Um... Throughout our year, we've like really liked the CS matchups, the teams that have like a bunch of CS players on it. Um, I don't know if it's me or my teammates or what, but it's it's just for some reason a bit easier to play because it makes more mm-hmm. sense. So the teams like Guard and Phase are the teams I'd rather have not played. So we liked our bracket, we liked our chances. Um, I don't know if there's someone we could lose to. I guess Hundred Thieves and Guard because they made it through, but um, there was no one we wanted to lose to, and we were happy to play C9 off Rip. We assumed that they probably didn't want to play us because we had just beat mm-hmm. them and they think we're good. So we were happy with the draw and yeah, yeah. I'm lucky, I guess. Uh, was it one of those tournaments where, because when I look at this LCQ and I'm trying to go through my pickems and trying to predict which team is going to make it to, to, to champions, it's always a coin flip between both, uh, both teams in any matchup that you currently see in the bracket. Do you feel that, uh, that it was that way as well when it comes down to... Um, you having that experience to scrim slash play against all of these teams because, you know, Hayes talked about sometimes on an off day, eh, any any team could win. Is that really the case? I think it's definitely the case. Uh, there was some stat, like, I don't know how many days in. It was maybe from the first weekend of LCQ. Like, the biggest map win was, like, a 13-8. Like, that was the, that was the mm-hmm. biggest mm-hmm. gap. And, like, this, there's a bunch of 13-11s, overtime games, just constantly. So... Whether it's that NA is bad and we're just scrappy or that we're all just actually that close, I'm not sure. But yeah, I think outside of Optic and, and probably Exit, uh, everyone is just so, so close. And mm-hmm. there, even those teams, when they play it, it's close. It's just, I think they have a level of consistency that's like maybe unmatched a bit from the other teams. So yeah, it's it's crazy close between everybody. Were there any teams whose performances surprised you in a negative way? Ours? <laughs> that doesn't count. <laughs> Pick someone else. Um, maybe C9, but I think they're still maybe struggling with the roster move. But once they beat us and Vanity was playing like so well individually, I thought that they were going to just steamroll, to be honest. Um, but they didn't. So maybe them. But I think everybody else played pretty well. Sentinels mm-hmm. was shocking. They played pretty well versus 100 Thieves, too. Um, I don't know if there's anyone that did that bad. I thought Energy looked really good, and they... Kind of went out pretty early, I guess. I I had them going far, um, but yeah, not really. Awesome. Well, uh, at least we actually have a little bit more of an update as well as to what we're discussing in terms of like player transfers and whatnot. And there's actually an article that came out earlier today from Dot Esports uh, that talks about any team that actually also moves up to the 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 uh, tier one level, uh, the partner program or that league then these rosters and teams will also be safeguarded where you can't get poached. You're really sticking with this roster for that whole, for that whole league, for that whole season, until you have uh, basically a, uh, a window where all these transactions could actually happen uh, in what we call the off season. And I think that's probably something that's been going on uh, anyways during like, for example, the Overwatch League uh, or, or something like that as well, where within the league in itself, that's that's a locked in period. You play with that, and then you see what happens as well. So it's nice to see that we have a little bit more of that uh, similarity from like a franchise franchise league versus the partnership program that we currently have, uh, or that we're about to have uh, with Riot overall. So um, with that said, we I, I want to continue on with with that with that question too uh, into the league into next year. Um, you know the conversations may be of to what's what was needed to be able to be part of that partnership program. Did you have any type of like conversations with Shopify Rebellion as to like, uh, what was the expectation out there coming from uh, their conversation with Riot? Um, there was a little bit. I mean, I we kind of got some inside info, I guess, from the Players Association about what they were looking for, mm. but it wasn't that much. Um, 
you know, we knew they wanted the big brands that, that have been in Valorant the whole time. So mm-hmm. I think Shopify knew if they were going to try, they had to show everything they had, which I think they did. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you mm-hmm. know, it just wasn't going to happen. So it is what it is. But um, I don't have too much info on what I'm just guessing really with what Riot <laughs> wants. And it's, you know, it's the big orgs and the big brands and the people that can show that they're going to be a good long term partner. Um, yeah. Probably financially and as like a content, you know, uh, growth. At least. And at least what's sure for you as well is while the the season is over for Shopify Rebellion for, during the VCTs and what happens in general too, after like the uh, the announcements of the, of the partnership program and be like, oh, well, tier two scene is quote unquote dead. We almost saw like a like all the memes coming out of like the tweets of the pro players and the organization saying, well, there goes our scrim schedule. There goes this, that, that. Is that really what happened once this was announced and you, you thought that the tier two scene was pretty much donezo? Uh, it was just like interesting timing because a couple orgs got dropped or it's a couple of teams got mm-hmm. dropped. And then it was so close to LCQ that a lot of teams stopped playing each other. If you're in LCQ, mm-hmm. you're probably not scrimming versus LCQ teams every day. I know some yeah. teams kind of kept doing it no matter what, at least maybe until a week before. So yeah, it was a scenario <laughs> where like so many of the tier two teams are either dropped or they're taking a break because they're not in LCQ and it's already kind of that player break thing and there's not much else mm-hmm. to play. And then you can't play the LCQ teams. And then there's the scenario of a split where splits out of the map pool in competitive. <laughs> and if you're not playing an LCQ team, then you can't play split. So no one's practicing split. And I think that's why the map rarely got played. I don't even know how many times it got played in LCQ, but um, yeah. So the practice was a little rough. Before. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah you know, we have our Probably three zero. representatives for, for champs. We have optic, we have X, we have hundred thieves. Do you feel like those are the three best potential teams to, to, take the crown like are they the best possible representatives we could have obviously aside from your own team yeah i think optic exit for sure and then 100 thieves you just have to see whether they got it on land basically i think they've looked super good and they are mm. just like right now it's two of them just pop off every map and it's just like pick two of them and they're gonna have two of them are gonna have a good game every map and that's how they played in lcq so I think if they got the confidence, if Derek is clutching 1v1s and 1v2s left and right, um, <laughs> and they were going to be the best, you know, the third best representative for us. So um, I wouldn't mind seeing Guard there either. If it wasn't going to be us, I think they could have probably learned from their last uh, experience mm-hmm. and done some work. But no, I think we have three pretty solid representatives. How do you feel about, um, you know, 100 Thieves having quite a lot of young less experienced players and now going into champions and this is going to be a lot of their first foray into that sort of environment do you think that's going to be something that they can overcome with the support of the more experienced people on the team including the support staff or do you think that that's going to end up as like a guard at masters one kind of deal i think something that's like super important when you're playing on LAN, like I said it with when the guard was at Masters one. Um, it's like they need to come out and you need to just like win a win a map or a series like really strongly. And then once you do that, it's like okay, you get it now. And I feel like to me at least it hinges a lot on that. Um, if they start slow, kind of get in their own heads, it's going to be a problem. But hopefully, I mean, Sean, their coaching staff is is really strong, so I would assume they're going to be fine in that department. But I think it's super important to like you just got to start out and get you got to get that first series win. So. Mm-hmm, if they mm-hmm. do that, I think they'll be fine. And, and I guess we, we I want to get to, back to, you were talking about the guard. Uh, that would have probably been a good representative as well for champions. How'd you find their improvement from, from stage two into the LCQ? Because again, as you're somebody, uh, if you're somebody that's just a, like a, you don't get into the weeds of theory crafting and, and finding the meta for a team, you're like, oh, okay, well, side players still play the Jet. Oh no, we have Net playing a breach, and then suddenly the the composition doesn't look like they're following a meta. Um, so what's your take into into the guards' improvements here? I don't know what happened because they honestly, I mean, I know they changed their comps, but they looked like mm-hmm. how they did in stage one. Yeah. And like stage, I don't know what happened in stage two for them, but <laughs> they looked like the players were doing what they were doing in stage one. So I don't know if MCE said some crazy shit or what, but they all like just refound themselves like Trent's just destroying everybody and Sai is going crazy Valens having mm. good games like I don't know what well, I don't know what happened to them in stage two but they got all they, got all, they, got, all their, they got all their sauce back in, in LCQ <laughs> well, what, what happened to Jonah P playing a brimstone in a fucking chamber and it's just popping off yeah. with all these aggressive pushes man like yeah. that was that was quite cool it, and I guess it comes down to like how much I guess it's it's the conversation is is it really worth it to spend a lot of times trying to find timings and 
uh, anti-strat your your opponents? Or at some point, how when are you going to trust the system that you're trying to implement for your team? Uh, I think, like, right now at least, I think if you're going to be playing these tournaments where you just have to play so many maps, it's mm -hmm. more worth it to just have, like, your own style and be switching, be able to switch agents and stuff because... It's just too easy to counter people if you're playing the same stuff on every map right now. And if you have to play three, four, five, six series, um, and you know you have your strong map pick with your good comp on the map, and like you're going to just get countered. So you have to be able to switch it up and, and focus mm -hmm. on yourself. You know, you mentioned Split not being played uh, very much. It wasn't actually played at all during it the wasn't, LCQ. It wasn't, was it? No, That's it wasn't I thought, yeah. Uh, it was Crazy. potentially a third map in a couple series that never yeah. got that far. But, you know, we talk about that. We talk about not being able to practice so much, sometimes things being done a little bit differently than we would like to see. It, what are your goals with the Players Association? Is that part of it? Like, potentially to have more direct communication with Riot to be like, hey, let's not remove this map from the map pool, or like, this agent's broken, we kind of need to patch it to make it viable, an esports player find a way to make it work better? Or is it more like sustainability, making sure that players can survive in the ecosystem beyond just the, the partner teams? A lot of our conversations haven't been centered around like in-game stuff like that. Um, sometimes we've talked, spoke about it, like little things about maps or agents, but almost like none of mm. our conversations is about that. It's mostly about what players need, how the partner system is going to work, how tier two is going to work, um, what needs to be in contracts, things like that. What orgs are doing what that's wrong and and things like that. So we haven't gotten a chance to talk about in-game stuff like that or formatting and formatting issues, um, which hopefully we will on the line but you know it's been kind of a i don't want to say shit show but it's just the last year they're doing this format so i don't know if people are so focused on it you know it is what it is this time and next time hopefully <laughs> it's a little bit easier for them to deal with and, and things like that don't happen yeah well at least now that uh, you guys are in the down period what's going on with uh, with the team and, and shopify rebellion right now uh, have you already taken your break after the lcq are you back at the scrimming to get ready for ignition se or reignition series or uh what's what's the calendar looking like for the rest of the year for shopify um we've well let's see we took a break after stage one for about three weeks um but besides that we've had basically no like real pause um, mm. so I think people are taking their time now. We're going to have a little break, um, mm -hmm. especially while more info comes out and, and stuff's, stuff's in the air. So, uh, we're chilling. We're chilling for now. Our first time chilling in a while. So yeah, <laughs> a little, play, little player break. Try, trying to dye your hair back from white to, to brown. Yeah. Just so that <laughs> for all these close <laughs> matches you've been having, but yo, uh, Will, I think I, I want to thank you for the time as well, because, um, I think that's that's all the time we're gonna have. Unless there's something that you also want to add. If not, any shout outs you want to give out as well to uh, to the listening audience right now and the viewers. Uh, I'm just gonna shout out Shopify again. This org's been insane. We didn't give them the result they wanted, but I gotta give them credit because uh, mm -hmm. they're an up and coming org and they're just insane. The support they give us. So go follow them on all their shit. <laughs> you know what? If even if you didn't give the the best results that you wanted, which is actually to win, I think you guys delivered a, a, a perfect and amazing series against clouded orgs such as Cloud Nine and Sentinel. So I think you guys should at be proud of that. that. And exactly, so <laughs> at least you should be proud of what you've been running uh, throughout the the whole season, throughout the whole year, despite all the COVID, all the changes in the roster going into the qualifiers. You did your best, and I think uh, you know it's only upwards from here. So I'm looking forward to see what's going to happen with with you guys going to the next year and what you have in store with Shopify Rebellion. So thank you so much for that, Will. Uh, and That's I think awesome. with that, yeah, we're going to we're gonna thank also Gio and, and, and Mark. Hopefully you guys had a good time on the show today. Putting you on the spot, Mark, what was it like today to, to make a comeback here on Valoranting? It was hot, dude. My office is really sweaty right now because I don't have the air conditioning <laughs> on. And I'm just like cooking alive. Uh, I made a tactical choice with the jacket and hat for the hair and the armpits, and I'm glad that I did. <laughs> and, and Geo, so like it wasn't your camera that was overheating after all. It's just you plug in for getting no, the plug. No, my camera so. overheated the first time, and then it ran out of battery the second time. So I was really not prepared. It's oh fine. man, it's cool. All right, all right. Well, at least we still had a good time. And and chat, thank you so much for for watching and for those that are listening as well on Spotify, on uh, Apple Music, and also watching on YouTube. Thank you so much and. Uh, we'll catch you every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time live here on twitch.tv forward slash dnpeak. And hopefully we'll see you next week for another edition of Valoranting. So with that, have a good evening. Peace out.